the end of the last ice age signaled the birth of modern Canada. But thousands of years later, much of the north is still buried under ice. Since the end of the last ice age, people have shaped and exploited other areas of Canada. But the ice and cold have made the far north seem impenetrable. Few people or animals feel at home in the far north. Less than 1% of North American mammals can survive year round above the tree line. Ice defines the Arctic. And what happens to ice here will influence the entire planet. Ice suits one creature more than any other in the Arctic. The polar bear. This mother built her den in the frozen ground and gave birth to a pair of cubs over the winter. She hasn't eaten for eight months. She's lost almost half her body weight and relies on a double layer coat of fur to keep warm. She needs to find food soon. But she'll have to wait until her cubs are confident enough to travel long distances. They have no immediate worries, as their mother will nurse them for around two years. So for now, they can explore and play. The ice that will become their greatest ally is at first strange and new. In early spring, this family will travel hundreds of kilometers to reach hunting grounds before the breakup of the sea ice. Polar bears have a huge variety of ways to hunt seals, but they all rely on the sea ice. To anyone who hasn't spent their life here, Arctic ice appears to be a single entity. In fact, it takes many different forms, both on land and sea. Varying massively in age, consistency and behavior. Some communities in the north have 70 different words to describe sea ice even more than they have for snow. Ice can be many different things, from gigantic glaciers to the smallest crystals. And some ice behaves in astonishing ways.
with the right conditions, one of the Arctic's secret ice wonders starts to grow. They are called frost flowers. Beautiful patterns of ice form on the frozen surface of the sea when temperatures suddenly plummet. No one knows for sure why they form, but scientists know that they contain a high concentration of bacteria, the essence of life. Only hours after they appear, their intricate structures start to fade, leaving no trace behind. Sea ice is almost always in flux. Under the right conditions, it can fleetingly attract a concentration of life. But at other times, the ice seems to form an endless wilderness and can be desolate and life-threatening, particularly for us humans. Drifting pack ice and icebergs can easily crush huge ships in minutes. But this didn't stop early explorers being fascinated by the Arctic. In the 19th century, there were dozens of European explorers trying to find the mythical Northwest Passage, a route from the Atlantic through the Arctic to the Pacific. No one ever made it and the sailors became terrified of the Arctic Ocean, and with good reason. Just two minutes in the freezing water could kill a man. The British were especially desperate to conquer the area. In 1845, John Franklin was handed the last and most notorious mission to break through and finally rule the vast, inhospitable area of the North. They thought their expertise was more advanced than any locals could offer. So they went fully stocked, taking everything they might need. Believing there was no way of finding food in such a cold place, they loaded 15 tons of canned food, the latest technology. It was enough to last them over three years. What they didn't realize is there's always plenty of food to find in the Arctic, if you only know where to look. The Inuit have exceptional understanding of local ice conditions. This patch of sea ice near the northeastern edge of Quebec seems barren. But it actually contains a precious bounty of food people are able to exploit. But this is no ordinary piece of sea ice. Seen from the level of the frozen sea, it looks as if cliffs are climbing up into the sky. But this illusion is created by the largest tides in the world, which are still flowing underneath the ice. When the tide comes back in, the temporary ice cliffs vanish once again.
This is a landscape that appears to breathe. The ice has claimed many lives as the force of 16 meter tides creates death traps when the ice cracks. But these tides also offer hidden opportunities. With all other traditional food sources hard to find in February, these hunters brave the minus 40 temperatures and head out to sea. They know that at the lowest tides, the sea under the thick ice retreats so far back that if you know what to look for, you can find stable hollow spaces under the ice. This gives them access to the rich bounty of the seabed, knowledge that has been passed down from generation to generation. They are willing to risk the danger of tons of ice just centimeters above their heads and ice starting to melt, all for an unlikely source of nutritious food. Thousands of rich mussels, enough to feed all their families. They have less than an hour to collect them before the tide returns. When the sea starts to come back, there's no time to lose. They need to leave now, before the cave fills with seawater and becomes deadly. In moments, the ice seals over, and there's no trace of anyone having been there. Like the Inuit, the animals that live year-round in the Arctic also know how to exploit local conditions to find hidden food. Even though sea ice that forms over winter will be one or two meters thick by spring, there are also places where the current and winds keep the water open. Called polinias, they act like oases in the desert and are magnets for animals. In the middle of the vast Hudson Bay, common eider ducks are drawn to one of these patches of open water to find food. They appear to fly as they dive to depths of 15 meters to forage on the ocean floor. They're looking for mussels and urchins. Their digestive juices are so powerful that they can eat the mussels, shells and all. They can dive a long way on a single breath. Knowing the way back up only takes seconds. In the deep winter, with a wind chill that makes it feel like minus 70, the opening in the sea ice is starting to close in. Without open water, the birds have a slim chance of survival.
The stronger birds sense what's happening and fly off to find new water, even though the distance they need to travel may be life-threatening. But to stay is also risky. The temperature needs to rise to keep the water open. At some indefinable point, the duck's options are gone. Their energy is fading. And they can't even dive to get food. Sadly for the ducks, the march of the ice here is unstoppable. And it turned out the sea ice was also not forgiving with the Franklin team. HMS Erebus and Terra were state-of-the-art steamships with reinforced iron plates, which made them able to sail through the sea ice in the summer. They thought they were going to command and conquer the elements. And during their first winter, they knew they would be icebound. Unbeknown to them, they had fatally chosen the wrong route. Like previous expeditions, they were relying on the spring melt to set them free again. Except on this occasion, that was never to happen. Winter's grip eventually loosens. By April, the sun is back for many hours each day and the land gradually warms. The rise in temperature triggers the spring melt, a period of frenetic change in activity in the Arctic. It happens at the flow edge, the boundary between the open water and the sea ice. It's the ice that is the key to the blooming of life here at this time of year. Long strands of algae grow which feed vast blooms of microscopic plankton, the food for an explosion of life here each spring. Under the ice, there's double the productivity than in the open ocean. Fish like the Arctic cod, seabirds and larger mammals like the seal are drawn in. In a matter of weeks, this seemingly desolate frozen sea has become a hot spot for life. Thick-billed myrrh arrive from the south, sensing the rise in temperature.
They know they're safe here on the sea, but they struggle to land with poise. Polar bears are arriving at the flow edge just at the right time. They know there's plenty of food on offer. This male has seen the vast numbers of myrrh and, ever the opportunist, comes to investigate. One injured myrrh is on the ice and has lost the power of flight. All it can do is walk away from the approaching bear. But the bear's sense of smell brings him closer. The camouflage that works so well on the dark water is useless on the snow. Although the bear does spot the bird, this time he's after more substantial prey. He's come to the flow edge to hunt ringed seals. Seals are most vulnerable when basking on the sea ice. So they choose open areas where they can keep an eye and a nose out for approaching predators. The polar bear goes hungry, again. Nine out of every ten hunts ends in failure. But the polar bear already stops looking for food, and there's plenty around here. Polar bears aren't the only big predators who've come to the flow edge to find seals. With harpoon ready, an Inuit hunter patiently waits, perfectly still, by a seal hole. The approach is so similar to the bears that it's easy to assume the polar bear originally inspired the Inuit thousands of years ago. Today, this seal isn't for the hunter. It's destined for the pack of dogs that brought him out here. The meat is so rich and nutritious that it will keep the dogs happy for days. This bear has finally succeeded in getting a seal. But he's gone about it in a most unusual way. He's found the leftovers of the dog's dinner in the heart of the hunter's camp. 
much to the dog's frustration. The bear has to build up enough fat reserves to last throughout the summer, as hunting will become much harder when the sea ice melts. A mother and two yearling bear cubs arrive at the foot of the cliffs near the flow edge. She's skinny and desperately needs food. The thousands of mers who are starting to nest on the narrow cliff ledges have caught her attention. The hungry mother has headed up the cliff to investigate, taking one cub with her. Later in the year, the bears will feast on myrrh eggs and chicks. But right now, the adult birds are just too hard to reach. The second cub, still on the ice, gets lucky when it finds an injured myrrh. This makes for a small but much needed meal. Up at the top of the cliff, the mother and cub are getting nowhere. The hungry cub resorts to eating moss. The lone cub catches up with the rest of its family. and they are happily reunited. And on these slippery slopes, what goes up must come down. At the bottom, their interest in the myrrhs finally pays off. The mother is able to feed as well. She needs to eat as she is still providing milk for the cubs. This tight family unit will stay together until next year and then the cubs will head off and fend for themselves. As spring continues, the sea ice starts to disintegrate. Even for the Inuit, this ice is much more unpredictable now than in years gone by. The dogs sense the thickness and stability of the ice through their paws, providing much more protection than riding on a snowmobile.
Gradually, the speed of the breakup accelerates. Life for those who depend on the ice becomes more precarious. With rising temperatures, the fragmentation continues, creating long passages between ice sheets called leads. The magical narwhal, with its spiraled elongated tooth, has been waiting for this moment. With no dorsal fin, they're perfectly adapted to the Arctic. They can dive under and through the ice the moment it starts to disintegrate. They're heading up long inlets to find a safe place to raise their calves. This breakup signals the start of the short but intense Arctic summer, where 24-hour sunlight and rising temperatures will transform the landscape. Half of all the sea ice in the Arctic melts each summer. It's the largest annual transformation on the entire planet. The summer's heat also triggers a huge change in land on the tundra. As the snow melts, female caribou migrate hundreds of kilometers to their calving grounds in the far north. More than half of all females will give birth within a few days of each other. It's a way of protecting the herd from predators. This year, the summer melt has come early. So the river current is strong. Soft snow makes it hard for the pregnant caribou to get out. But these are some of the most resilient animals on Earth and they keep on going. On one of the longest days of the year, the mothers start to give birth. Within minutes, a newborn calf is up on its feet. Within hours, they walk well. And within days, they can keep up with their mother over long distances. Ah. 
Fresh vegetation grows vigorously with a 24-hour sunlight and gives the mother enough energy to produce milk. Today, across the Arctic, caribou numbers are falling dramatically. Variability in the timings of the summer melts and winter freeze-up doesn't help, as their finely tuned body clocks are out of sync with the new seasons. At the height of this most productive time, they share the tundra with lots of other species. But with no trees, nesting birds are vulnerable to predators, like the Arctic fox. Canada geese make themselves big and threatening. But the fox is not actually after the birds. The fox buries the egg, knowing that harder times may soon lie ahead. It can return to the exact spot at any time for a ready meal when there's less easy prey about. In the Arctic, it's all about reaping the rewards when they're on offer. In the 19th century, the ill-fated Franklin team failed to find local food but they thought they could live off the supplies they brought with them. All they wanted to do was continue their journey. But when the spring and summer came, the ice never melted, and their ships didn't move. They had chosen a particularly bad bay to be caught in over winter. They eventually starved when their food ran out, and none of the 129 men survived. If the Franklin team met local Inuit, they didn't heed any advice about how to survive there. If asked, the Inuit would have been able to provide some clues about gathering food in the summer. For centuries, they gathered eggs to eat. These large ones are from the eider duck, the same bird that struggled to survive in the ice over winter. The Inuit also hunted the ducks for their incredibly insulated skins that they would sew together with sinew to make warm cloaks. Today, the Inuit are resourceful in intriguing new ways. They take the warmest feather in the world, eiderdown, most commonly known from pillows and duvets. They leave enough to keep the eggs warm. And the mother duck will shed more down from close to her skin to build up the nest again.
The down will be used as stuffing for overcoats. At the end of the warm season, this community are well prepared to be able to hunt over winter. The collection of feathers takes a few minutes and no birds are killed. So the eider ducks are less disturbed than they used to be. Recently, the summer sea ice has been disappearing at a faster rate than anyone could imagine. We don't yet know how these changes will affect some life here. Although walrus use ice to rest on, they also love to bask on rocks in the summer sun. Walrus are bottom feeders. They shoot out water from their mouths to excavate clams. Sensitive bristles help find them in the muddy seabed. Then they suck them out with their vast rubbery lips. It's harder for some Arctic animals to adapt to their changing world than others. As the ice season gets shorter, polar bears have less time to hunt. During the longer, warmer summers, their metabolism slows right down to conserve energy. Some bears who didn't catch enough seals eat seaweed to fill their stomachs. Others pluck individual berries off thorny bushes. But these are meager pickings and provide nowhere near enough calories for a hungry bear. What they need is fat and protein. And that means they must hunt. A few ingenious bears in northern Quebec have worked out that the Arctic char, a fish like salmon, can be found here this time of year. The fish can't survive in the icy winter ocean, so they all return inland before it gets too cold. This gives the waiting polar bears a chance to catch them. The conditions that worked so well at the flow edge are long gone. And unlike grizzly bears, this kind of chase doesn't seem to come easy to them. last, this bear gets a meal with some protein. For the polar bears that stayed at the coast, the ice cannot return fast enough.
At the height of the summer in the Canadian Arctic, thousands of beluga whales head to Somerset Island for a seasonal gathering. Like the narwhal, they're adapted for a life in the Arctic. They don't have a dorsal fin. And they have a huge amount of blubber, up to 50% of their body weight. But they haven't come here to feed. They're here for an equivalent of a health spa. This shallow estuary contains a mix of fresh and seawater which is warmer than the open ocean. The water and the gravel allows them to have a body scrub, which helps get rid of their old skin. They appear to love it. But the beluga can't relax too much. They face new threats as a result of the changing summer conditions. Killer whales have traditionally found it hard to hunt in these icy waters due to their massive dorsal fin, often taller than an adult human. They aren't able to travel far under the sea ice because their dorsal fin could get in the way of them getting to the air at the surface. Today, as more of the sea ice is melting each summer, they appear to be increasing in number. Coming in from the Atlantic, specifically to hunt large marine mammals like beluga and narwhal. Many feel they're fast becoming the polar region's new top predator. Although polar bears can swim vast distances, hunting in an ice-free ocean is virtually impossible. The northern frozen landscape that used to suit the bears perfectly is now melting faster than anyone could have predicted. This is the dawn of a new age for the Arctic. Much of the long-term ice, some of it hundreds of thousands of years old, is starting to melt. In as little as 20 years, the summer in the Arctic Ocean may be completely ice-free. And the irony is, people have unknowingly created these new conditions. If the Franklin crew had undertaken their mission to sail to the open water of the Pacific today, they undoubtedly would have succeeded. The Arctic waters where they got stuck are now ice-free every summer.
The open ocean is giving Canadian researchers more opportunities now to find the exact whereabouts of Franklin's sunken boats. From coast to coast, people have always transformed the environments of wild Canada. But the largest change of all is happening in the one area thought too removed and too extreme to be altered by humans. The biggest alteration of the Arctic in the last million years is unfolding right before our eyes. With inevitable winners and losers. key points in history, the Arctic has been connected with exploration and discovery. At the end of the last ice age, when people and animals came into the continent. At the time of Franklin's attempt to reach the Pacific. And today, where we find a new global frontier opening up.